9.35, our guest in this segment is Glenn Elliott. He is the mayor of Wheeling, two-termer, uh, by the way. He's a candidate for U.S. Senate on the Democratic primary side. He is one of three in that Democratic primary for the U.S. Senate. Glenn, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Rob, good, uh, good morning. It's great to finally be on your show. Well, it's great to have you. Uh, tell us, what, you, what do you know about this uh, Kevin knuckles Nolsey here, the uh, mayor of Martinsburg? What do you know about this guy? <laughs> I consider Mayor, Mayor Knowles to be one of my best, uh, you know, best friends as mayor that I've met. Uh, you know, I've had a great opportunity to, uh, to be mayor here for almost eight years now and met uh, pretty much, you know, every mayor across the state. Uh, uh, mayor Knowles has done a great job in Martinsburg. Uh, I just saw him a couple weeks ago down in Charleston. Uh, we meet there for our winter conference every year. And, uh, you know, I consider him a good friend, and I really like what he's been able to do. You have quite the resume. Uh, maybe you could run through it a little bit for us, Glenn, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. Uh, you know, born and raised in Wheeling. I went uh, to the Lindsley School here, then went away to college at University of Pennsylvania. Um, my first job, actually very interesting, was was working for Senator Byrd in his D.C. office. I was a legislative assistant for him. I uh, got to write speeches for him, you know, sit by him on the Senate floor, uh, see the Senate back in the 90s when it was a little different than it did today. It still basically worked as it was supposed to. Uh, you didn't see the filibuster used as a, a matter of of you know of regularity it was the exception uh you know the, at the congress at that time actually believe it or not actually balanced the budget you had a a democratic president and a republican congress uh, that didn't really like each other but they got in the room and they figured out a path to budget and at uh, balancing the budget and i think by 1999 when i actually left my job there uh, there was a balanced budget and uh uh which i think it's been 25 years since we've had one um then went on to law school at georgetown um and then uh after Georgetown went to a law firm in D.C., thought that's what I wanted to do after about seven or eight years of being sort of in the law world, in the big law firm world, realized that I was not happy. I was kind of miserable. Uh, quit my job, came back home to Wheeling in, um, in 2009, uh, got involved in stuff, ended up buying an old building in downtown that had been vacant. It's now my home. And uh, I started getting some, not- uh, some notoriety locally, I guess, and decided to run for mayor in uh, 2016 and got elected first-time candidate, and then got reelected in 2020. So now I'm finishing up my second and final term. I'm up barred from a third term under our charter. And why do you think you would make a good senator? Well, uh, you know, being mayor is um, a really way, when you look at the, at the way Congress is not functioning well right now, um, I really think it's time to tap into some of our talent at the local level. Um, you know, my friend Steve Williams is running for governor. He's uh, you know, had a great uh, record as mayor in, in Huntington. Um, you know, I've had a, a record here in Wheeling where we've been able to get a lot of stuff You know, Wheeling's a pretty conservative city. Um, you know, we've been able to work with people on the left and the right to get stuff done. Not everything's been easy. Uh, not everything's been uh, non-controversial. But, uh, you know, mayors don't have the luxury of sitting back and you're reading uh, partisan talking points. They, you, uh, I'm sure you've heard it said before, there's no Republican pothole or no re- a Democratic puddle is just puddles. You got to get stuff done. You got to get stuff fixed, or you can't go out to the grocery store and have people not come up to you and yell. So, um, you know, I think I have the top red force. Um, you know, I'm someone who can uh, pretty much talk to anybody. Uh, you know, what I found is is a lot of times we we focus on our disagreements on issues, but we 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 forget that as Americans and as West Virginians, we often have shared values that are much less uh, disparate. And if we can. Just, I kind of wrap ideas around the values instead of just you know getting uh, stuck on these issues. It's it's possible to get stuff done. So I think I have the temper for it. I'm I'm under no illusions that the Democratic brand in the state right now is a little bit challenged. I think that's that's probably an understatement, and I know it's going to be an uphill battle. Uh, but I really think you know the more people I get to meet and talk to, um, you know, I think I mean I really can make a case for why it's time to look in this direction. Uh, what, uh, I think to take what I've been able to do in Wheeling. Uh, take my experience actually working in the Senate when it did work and and really take uh, this background, uh, you know, to D.C. on behalf of people of West Virginia. So, you know, I'm looking forward to the opportunity. Hey, Glenn, your cell's uh, kind of going in and out at times. For the most part, it's a strong signal, okay. so I'm not sure if you're moving around or not, or, but did you, wherever you are now, stay steady because it sounds great. All right, I'm sitting in my office. Sorry about that if it's breaking up. But. No, no problem. Bill? Yeah, uh, good morning, Glenn. Uh, 
you mentioned a second ago that uh, that Steve Williamson is running for the governor. Uh, both of you have done, from all reports, been from the Eastern Panhandle. We have not seen firsthand, but from all reports, you both have done an outstanding job as mayor of your respective cities. Uh, is there any thought been given to you and Steve Williams uh, running? Uh, uh, collectively, not collective in total, but uh, but you use the same platform to promote both yourself and the other guy at the same time. Uh, certainly, uh, Steve was just uh, you know up in Wheeling last week. We had a reception up here. Uh, Steve I was here, but uh, Steve has the luxury of not having a primary. Uh, you know, I do. I have a primary, so I think for the ter- uh, for the time being in the primary, I'm going to have to focus on you know running my own campaign. I do think you know if I get through the primary. Uh, you know, uh, Mayor Williams and I have great stories to tell. You know, we've been able to get a lot of things done in cities uh, that really were struggling to reinvent themselves. Wheeling is a city that has an incredibly proud history. Uh, but, you know, by the end of the 20th century, our downtown had been decimated. We lost all of the retail to, a, you know, a nearby shopping mall. Uh, you didn't see much except a couple banks and law firms. And, you know, we've been trying to re sort of discover ourselves. The same story can be said in Huntington, uh, maybe a different a few different specifics, but, you know, Steve's done a great job down there. You know, we've really pushed the needle here. Wheeling, if you've been in Wheeling lately, it's nothing but construction right now. And, you know, people are a little frustrated with all construction, but I'm, I tell people all the time, orange is the new green here. It's, it's, uh, you know, these uh, construction barrels are going to uh, be gone soon and we're going to see a com- com- completely rebuilt town. And, you know, it, uh, you know, what I, uh, what I would say is, you know, Steve was up here last week. He called this the year of the mayor. And I really think there is an opportunity for folks just to look at what we've been able to do as mayors, um, you know, in our city, and then compare that to, you know, where the state's kind of been over the last 8, eight 10, 15 years. I think our cities have moved the needle a lot more uh, respectably uh, than maybe the state as a whole. And maybe that's something it, it, uh, the rest of the state could look at. Uh, you mentioned primary opponents. Who are they? You have two yep. opponents. Who are they? Uh, yes, I have one gentleman, uh, Zach Shrewsbury, and then the other one, um, Don Blankenship, got in the race. I don't oh. think he's a Democrat, but he did get in the race a couple of weeks ago. We just on the filing deadline. John Gilstrap. Good morning, Glenn. Um, I, hey. I have a very practical question for you. You, you, sure. you said yourself that Wheeling is a conservative city, and as a conservative sure. city in a conservative state, why not run as a Republican in a conservative state? I'm not a Republican, John. I mean, look, I, uh, you know, I grew up in a family that was an FDR and JFK a Democratic Party family. Uh, you know, I've always – the Democratic Party is, uh, to me, uh, has a great and proud history to tell, but it doesn't always do a good job of telling that history. Um, you know, the party that I identify with is the one that's looking out for the underdog. Um, you know, I would, you know, talk to my grandfather about, you know, what would – what life was like in this country before the Great Depression and before the Roosevelt administration. And that was the party that I identify with. I recognize now that the Republican side has defined Democrats in a way that doesn't really look like they're out for the, I mean, for the little guy. Um, you know, that's, I mean, frankly, our fault for letting them define us that way. But, um, you know, this particular Senate seat I'm going for has been held by Democrats since the 1940s uh, or 50s. So, um, you know, I think you know, there's a proud history of uh, of Democrats holding this particular seat. I recognize that the state has shifted. Um, but I'm down here in Wheeling running, you know, as a Democrat. You know, uh, to be fair, our races here aren't partisan, but, but when I ran, it was pretty clearly known that I was a Democrat. Uh, and as long as you talk to people and, and meet them, I mean, around the issues that matter, uh, you know, people can look past that. We're, we're, hey, Glenn, we're starting to lose your cell a little bit there. I'm sorry about that. I'm, I'm standing right by my window. If you're going to go outside, I will, but you might hear some, uh, some noise. Yeah, that sounds good where you are now. I'm not sure what changed, but okay. uh, go ahead. So, no, so, yeah, so the Democratic Party is in my blood. Um, you know, I'm not going to change parties. I, I know there's many uh, Democrats who have changed parties because of where the state's gone, but to me, that, that's, that's not, uh, you know, that wouldn't be honest to who I am. Um, I don't agree with the party on everything that it wants to do today. You know, I have some... Uh, concerns, but at the same time, you know, the Democratic Party, when it's at its best, is looking out for, you know, working people, uh, looking out for underdogs, you know, defending civil rights, and really, uh, you know, trying to make this economy work for everybody, and not just those at the top. Um, so, you know, I'm going to run as a Democrat, uh, you know, that's in my blood, and I recognize it's going to be a challenge, but, you know, I, when I ran for mayor here, not a lot of people gave me a much of a chance, and I won my race here by 15 points back in 2016 against an incumbent vice mayor. So I like 
uh, being the underdog a little bit, I like looking forward to the challenge, and it's going to make me work a lot harder. So let me ask you this. The... Um... I would argue you can address it or not. Just from where I, I sit, the, the Democratic Party today bears little resemblance to the Democratic Party of of even JFK. But um, we are the run for the Senate is about the balance of power. It's really about who gets to sit on the Supreme Court. It's, there, there's a lot of and, and given the fracture of politics today, that where everybody's gone to the to the to the mattresses to. Uh, to, to borrow a, a mafia phrase, um, where do you stand on the two issues here? First of all, how do we fix the fracture? And secondly, on Monday, uh, we had a guest on here who revealed that as of this year, total service on the debt on the trillions of dollars uh, in deficits we have for the first year, the service on, on our national debt exceeds the entire defense budget of the United States. Yeah. So the, as a party, from where I sit, the Democrats kind of are, have been labeled the tax and spend party. Republicans have no place to hide on this because they, they do the same thing. So how, where, where does it stop? How do we bring the, the economy under control or the spending under control? And how do we fix the fracture? Yeah, well, uh, look, um, you know, I would go back to my own experience. When I was working in, in the Senate in the 90s, um, you, know, um, you know, President Clinton and inherited a situation where there was – uh, really, for the first time in, in U.S. history, a prolonged uh, budget deficit problem. And he put forward a program where, you know, the wealthy pay a little bit more in their fair share. It had some, uh, some spending cuts in there. It had some reductions. And it was able to get on a path to balance. And then, of course, you had the Republican Congress that uh, came in in, uh, in 1994. And they, uh, you know, put forward some further spending cuts. And they got it to balance but by 1999, um, you know, like – uh, oh, when you say the Democrats have a tax and spend problem, I get that argument, but Republicans have a borrow and spend problem. Um, you know, we had no deficits of prolonged, uh, you know, uh, we had no prolonged deficits in this country until Ronald Reagan was elected president. Then you look at our debt, like, like that was the first time we actually started growing deficits. Uh, then uh, the, uh, that can c- uh, continue through President Clinton. Uh, then President Clinton actually balanced the budget, again, working with the Republican Congress, but when President uh, Bush 43 got in office, uh, the budget deficit exploded. Uh, of course, he, he handed things over to President Obama, who was able to bring some deficit reduction back to the equation. And then we know what happened when President Trump was elected. The deficit went to uh, records we've never seen before, in part because of COVID, but also because of some tax cuts that weren't paid for. Um, and so, look, um, both parties have some blame in this, but the Democrats have at least been able I've been willing to pay for the spending that they support, whereas Republicans just believe, in my opinion, that if you just cut spending, the economy is just going to grow by some a ridiculous amount. The old lack of per argument of, of supply side or whatever. Hey, Glenn. It hasn't been proven. Yes. Do you have access to a landline anywhere nearby? You could call us back? I probably could here. Um, I'm sorry. It, um, we're, we're... I could go get one if you want. Yeah, we're, we're just losing too much of what you're trying to say. Uh, it kind of comes and goes in, in garbled uh, little segments. But uh, we, have, we have one more two-minute commercial break we need to take. So if you can find a landline and call me back on, on that landline on the same number that you just called in on, that would work out great. Is that okay with you? Okay, Rob, I'll do that. Just give me a minute, and I'll call you right back. All right, thank you very much. And uh, Colin Good, and queue up our final commercial break here. We'll just take it right now and be right back and reestablish contact with Mayor Glenn Elliott from the city of Wheeling as a candidate for Senate in the Democratic primary coming up. More to come after this. Uh, in the meantime, uh, as Glenn searches for a uh, landline, he wasn't sure if he actually would be able to access one, but I didn't see a purpose in continuing with the interview as garbled as his cell was kind of going in and out of and being so there's only so much you can do in those situations most of the time cell lines work but when they don't it's not good yeah and and if you talk in short burst it seems to work but the more you talk it tends to become overloaded and it becomes garbled in his connection yes yeah. at least anyway john you were looking at the federal budget deficit and uh you had a chart in front of you you were commenting yeah the, during the break um we were talking about the, the the clinton administration did in fact balance the budget and brought us back from a whopping deficit of 255 billion dollars um now we're facing well let's see i can actually 1.5 trillion i think in the last year um as of the end of 2023 it was 1.6 and i call it 1.7 trillion 1. um but that was up from it's it's 
real bottom in 2020 of significantly more than that. Um, and John, I can remember Ronald Reagan making this as a, a campaign issue, and he brought in front of the TV cameras a stack of papers that uh, that illustrated the budget. Can you imagine that stack of papers today? No, I can't. Well, you couldn't fit it in the room. You the, cannot fit it. The, the absolute nadir here was in 2020, at the end of 2020, it was 3.1 trillion. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was at the COVID spending, right? Right. 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 Uh, Glenn is back with us via telephone. Mayor, good morning again. Thank you for reestablishing contact. Uh, good morning again, gentlemen. I was not able to get to a landline at the time, but I did uh, relocate myself. All right. Well, that, so hopefully this is better. So far, so far sounds good. So, Bill, you wanted to ask a question about Social Security Medicare. Yeah, uh, Glenn, uh, our deficit, federal deficit, has been talking points for several years. Ronald Reagan made it when he was running, and every president yeah. sub subsequent has made it. But we're getting to the point that we cannot afford it to be only a talking point. We're getting to the point that action has to be taken. Discretionary spending is approximately 17% of our budget, so it's impossible to make a major inroads to a federal deficit just discretionary spending. That carries us back to two or three areas, one of which is the, uh, the uh, guard rail of politics, third rail of politics, and that's Social Security and Medicare. We're getting to the point that we have to seriously look at uh, at these. What would be your approach to the to the so-called guardrail of politics? Well, Bill, you're absolutely right that those are issues uh, where the can's been kicked down the road for far too long. Uh, social, I mean, Social Security is obviously uh, one that has really changed the entire nature of our society. You know, giving uh, uh, giving seniors some guarantee uh, some guarantee of a comfortable retirement is something that was a radical idea back in the 30s. It's something we have to preserve. Um, you know, if you look at uh, there's different ways to change the uh, funding of it. You know, uh, the cap that's set, it's only uh, you're only taxed on the first 100,000 of income for that. That was set uh, decades ago. You, I think you need to look at raising that cap for folks, um, you know, uh, so the people making more than 100,000 are also paying into it as well. Uh, right now, you know, if you make uh, if you make a million dollars a year, you'll, you're only paying FICA taxes on that first uh, first, a hundred thousand. I think we need to look at raising that. One, it's at one sixty right now, Glenn. I think it is. Oh, is it one sorry right. Yeah, but it hasn't gone up much. Well, uh, it goes up with inflation every year, basically. But it hasn't gone up from a, um, a you know, in any real terms. It's, it's basically gone up to match the economy. It hasn't gone up in real terms. We need to look at that. Uh, you know, any changes you make to the funding or to, or to the benefit formula, I think you have to make sure you do it in the out years. You can't. Uh, you know, uh, change things for people who are, are at or near retirement age now because uh, they haven't had time to plan for it. But you can make changes. I think Reagan uh, made changes that went into effect 15, 20 years afterwards. Uh, I think you have to look at approaches like that. Um, you also have to recognize that for, um, you know, uh, people think you get back what you paid into it. But if you live into your 90s, you've made back uh, four or five or six or ten times more than what you ever paid into I think we need to look at maybe means testing it for uh, for people once they've already got back what they paid in. Uh, there's no reason that Elon Musk needs to get the same Social Security benefits that someone else would, um, you know, after uh, getting back what he paid in. And there's a lot of ways you can look at it. Look, it's not easy. No one wants to uh, talk about this issue because it is so politically um, you know, charge, but we can't just do nothing and expect it still to be there for future generations. It's going to take some tough choices. I think by 2034 or five, I yeah. think it goes down to 77 percent of the benefit, if I remember yeah. reading my latest Social Security statement. And the yeah. and the other option is Department of Defense, but in our unstable yeah. world now, I'm not sure that's yeah. a path anybody wants to take. Fair point. No, I think uh, defense spending is something that, if you look at it, it's it's continued. I mean, it's gone up basically under uh, uh, presidents of both administrations. I think we do have an important role in in the world. Uh, but at the same time, we have to be very careful before we send men and women across, uh, you know, across across oceans to engage in conflicts, um, because uh, we can get into these long, drawn out conflicts. Uh, the Afghanistan conflict lasted a lot longer than it probably should have. The Iraq conflict probably shouldn't have happened in the first place. And, you know, we need to be very careful about that. Uh, Bill, you also asked about Medicare. And, you know, that's also a tough one. But we have to get the cost of health care itself under control in this country. Uh, we spend more on healthcare than any other country in the world by far, and we're not getting anything close to the best results. So, 
Um, you know, until we fix health care itself, and I'm not saying I have all the answers on that. It's a really complicated issue. Um, but, you know, we can't keep spending what we do for health care and expect that Medicare is going to be brought under control because seniors, I've seen it. My father just passed away here in November, and he was on Medicare, and I saw his health care expenses over the a couple of years leading up to it, and it was astronomical. I um, mean, the things that should not cost what they were, uh, basic tests and PET scans and everything else costing just like tens of thousands of dollars to all be billed to Medicare. We have to look at the costs uh, going into this if we're ever going to solve the problem on the Medicare end because obviously oh, we want our seniors to have a comfortable retirement both from, uh, you know, financial and, you know, health care stability. My, my son just text me, sent me a text. He's 37, says, if I only get back what I pay in, why not let me keep it, like, in my pocket? Well, the problem with that, John, is that, is that some people will and some people won't, and then what do you do with the people that don't? Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, obviously it's a socialized system of basically, you know, providing some minimum floor for people. So at the end of the day, um, you know, you're going to have at least a floor of income coming in. I recognize that, uh, you know, there are arguments that people, if they took that money invested in the stock market, you know, they, well, they would end up doing better. Um, and for some people, that's absolutely true. I know people who are very, very good at investments, uh, but other people, as, as we all know, aren't going to make investments. They're going to spend everything they, everything they can in real time on you know, real needs, and they're not going to save away for retirement. And if you don't have that actual baseline there, I think it is problematic. So, look, it's a tough issue. I mean, I'm not afraid to talk about either of these issues because you're absolutely right. If you look at the federal budget, so much is now – um, you know, in these, if you add these two plus defense, that's a big chunk of the federal budget. We're not going to balance the budget just with discretionary spending cuts alone. Uh, so we have to look at these. And, you know, I'm open to these conversations. Glenn, appreciate you joining us. Let's have you back on again sometime in the very near future before the primary so we can uh, talk more about these issues. I look forward to it, and I'll make sure to be on a landline or in studio for that uh, opportunity. That'd, Thank you to all gentlemen. That would be awesome. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks, Glenn. All right. Thank you. Glenn Elliott candidate for U.S. Senate in the Democratic primary coming up. He's got two opponents uh, in there as well as Zach Shrewsbury and Don Blankenship. Bill, I'll see you on Friday. Looking forward to it. Mr. Gilstrap's running the table. He's back tomorrow. I know. See ya. Dave Ramsey shows next. This is Talk Radio. We're on our Martinsburg and TV 10. We'll talk again in 22 short hours.